Okay, welcome everybody. So today I wanted to talk to you about um, a little bit more about resonance and then also um, the formal charges um, and why that's important. And then some exceptions to the octet rule and, and get us all the way to where we're going to start to talk about shapes. So you know, when we talked about resonance, we talked about the movement of electrons. I asked you to figure out what benzene was. And so you know, benzene looks like this. Let me just cancel that. Benzene looks like this, where you have six carbons in a ring. And then you have these alternating double and single bonds. You have double, single, double, single, double. And then hydrogen is coming off of each of these. So now resonance for this, I could actually move those electrons around. So I could take those electrons and I can move them between the carbons. And so I'll get a resonance structure where the double bonds are in those other spots. And in fact, the electrons are what's known as delocalized. So they use this term, delocalized. And the electrons can move throughout the, the molecule. And this stabilizes the molecule. A lot of times they'll call it resonance stabilization. Sometimes they'll draw benzene in a skeletal structure like this, and they'll just draw a circle to show that the electrons can move. It looks like a birdhouse. All right, so let's talk about formal charge a little bit here. So when I think about formal charge, um, it's basically what the charge on each element would be. Charge on each element would be but I'm going to pause this and shut the door. Just give me one second, please. So, like I was saying, it's the charge on each element, what it would be if the elements shared electrons evenly. And when we talk about polarity later on, you'll see that, elect that electrons aren't always shared evenly, even though they're considered to be shared. But here, this would be, okay, the electrons are being shared evenly between two atoms. What's their formal charge? And this relates to the electronegativity of the elements. And we want to make sense of the formal charge. Well, let me give you the equation first. The formal charge on any element is equal to the number of valence electrons that it has minus the number of bonds it makes plus its lone electrons. So if we look at the example below, let's look at this one here. There's resonance structures and formal charges. Let's look at the nitrogen on the left here. And so if I zoom into this here, we have nitrogen has five valence electrons minus it formed one bond plus it has one, two, three, four, five, six. So that's five minus seven which is where we get the negative two from. That's the formal charge. Carbon in the middle, it has four valence electrons minus one, two, three, four bonds, plus no lone electrons, so it has a formal charge of zero. And oxygen over here, it has a formal charge of plus one, and that's because it has six valence electrons minus one, two, three bonds, plus two lone electrons, and that gives us plus one. And we can see if we do that for each of these, we get different formal charges. Now, why do we care about this? What's so important about the formal charges? Well, the thing with the formal charges is this. You want the formal charges to be closest to zero. That's when the structure is most stable. Now, sometimes they can't be zero. Sometimes, if you have an ion like this, see how this is negative and negative? They can't be zero. The formal charges add up to what the charge is of the entire molecule or ion. So you want them closest to zero. But at the same time, though, you want to follow this other rule. You want the formal charge of the more electronegative element to be more negative. So let's look at these, you know, I look on the left here and I see the formal charges aren't really close to zero at all. They're like all over the place. So that structure is probably not going to be that stable. 
The other issue I have with it is look at the oxygen. If you look up the electronegativity of each of these elements, you'll see oxygen has one of the higher electronegativities. It should never really be positive one unless under some you know extreme circumstances. If I look at the next one over here, oh wow. So if I look at this one, these are really close to zero. That's good. And this one too is really close to zero. So which one's better? Well, they they have the same, you know, like number of zeros and they both have a negative one. But when I look at the electronegativity of nitrogen, nitrogen's electronegativity is three and oxygen's is 3.5. The oxygen should get the more negative formal charge. This species over here, number three, is probably the most stable because of that. So just to summarize, when you look at formal charges and they're different for different resonance structures, then you should really pick the one where the formal charges are closest to zero and where if there has to be a negative formal charge or a positive formal charge, the negative formal charge will go to the more electronegative element, whereas the, um, whereas the positive formal charge will go to the less electronegative element. Now, um, here's some resonance structures showing you what's going on here. This is O3. O3 could look like this um, with its dots. Or it could look like this. A lot of times they'll draw two arrows to show that they're resonating. So we have our structure like this. And so these are my two, you know, like resonance structures. Now here, if I assign formal charges to these, um, it shouldn't matter. So if I go on the, on the O on the left here, I'll do this in a different color, like, like uh, green. I wanted green. Where are you, green? Okay, so this would be negative one. This would be plus one. And this would be zero for the formal charges. And if I look at this one, well, now this would be zero this would be plus one, and this would be negative one. So when I look at these, I don't see any difference in the formal charges overall. It's just, you know, there's one oxygen that has a zero, one that has a plus one, one that has a negative one. And so for this reason, they will call this equivalent resonance structures. And so what you end up with is you end up with a mixture of both the molecules. Neither one is favored over the other one. And that's important because what that tells me is that, oh, you know, they're kind of mixing back and forth evenly. And what you end up with, you end up with two bonds that are neither double or single. You end up with two bonds that are kind of equivalent to each other. There's this constant movement of electrons. Um, if I go back up here to the NCO, which is, um, which is um, cyanate ion, if I look at that one, the formal charges are different for each of these resonance structures. I need to choose the best one. They're not all going to be equal. We'll practice more of this in class, but it's important that you see this. Okay, so, you know, we went through drawing Lewis structures, and I left out the last steps in the Lewis structures. If I go over here and show you, um, there's this step right here. If not enough electrons in step six, so we're going from six to nine here, add extra to the central atom and violate the octet rule. And that's possible. If I try and draw one of these um, structures here with O, I could draw XE like this, XEO3 like this. And if I draw this and you count this up, you'll actually get 26 electrons. It's kind of cool. It's done. But if I go ahead and I try and do the formal charges on these, if I look at the formal charges here, I have a formal charge over here of negative one, a formal charge of negative one, a formal charge of negative one, and a formal charge over here of plus three. Look at the formal charges over here. This O is zero, this O is zero, this O is negative one, and this is plus one. But check out the XE over here, the XE, it has two electrons, four, six, eight, ten, twelve electrons. It went way over the octet rule. Formal charges here are much better though. This is the structure that actually exists. When scientists look at this, they can tell the structure based on the length of the bonds, and they see that the structure I put a check over is the one that's accepted. Because the formal charges are so much more stabilizing. But check this out though, that XE, it went way above. 
How can the XE do that? How can that XE go above that? Well, the answer is because it has empty d orbitals. And it can use those empty d orbitals. It can hold up to 10 electrons. It can use those d orbitals to make extra bonds. People came up with the octet rule because it sort of explained, you know, well, you know, most atoms that people were working with early on, they only formed enough bonds to have eight valence electrons. And that's because a lot of those atoms are in period two. As soon as you go to elements that are in period three, you'll see that those elements, they can violate the octet rule, and they do it often. It's more like, you know, the octet suggestion rather than the rule, um, the guideline. Here's another example. Here we have boron with three bonds. And remember, I said boron can violate the octet rule by underachieving. It won't get eight. And so we can see that they show you three structures over here where it does form an octet. But go ahead, assign the formal charges to those. You'll see fluorine is positive one where it's double bonded. That will never ever happen because fluorine is so electronegative. It just won't occur. So here's some other um, violations to the octet rule. So here with ICL4, if I were to add these up, I would have seven times five and then a negative um, charge here, I'd have 36 electrons. So when I put the I in the middle and connect the four CLs, if I don't put these on, I'll have only 32. So I need to add extra electrons to the central atom, 33, 34, 35, 36. You can see the same thing with XEF2. XEF2 has 22 electrons, 14 and 8 is 22 electrons. Oops. So if I start off here with just the octet, and I don't include those two that I highlighted, I only have 20 electrons, so I add on an extra two. Now I have 22 electrons. These molecules are common. So I tell you about the octet rule. You've heard about it before, but in reality, the octet rule is sort of more like a guideline. All right, one last thing I want to do with you today is um, talk to you about coordinate covalent bonds. Coordinate covalent bonds are where electrons in a covalent bond come from only one atom. So let's take, for example, you have NH3 like this. Here's NH3. And it's in a solution that contains some H+. This H+, it has no electrons of its own. So what happens is this H+, over here, it's attracted to this nitrogen's electrons. And it forms a bond. It forms a bond like this. If we highlight this and put a plus sign out here because it's positive, bracket it, put a plus sign out here, we have ammonium. This is ammonia. This is ammonium, one of the polyatomic ions that you're supposed to remember. This is a coordinate covalent bond right here. Both of those electrons, they came from the nitrogen. They didn't come from the hydrogen. You see this also with another one, water. And again, water, sometimes the solution contains acid that has this H+. It has no electrons. So this will be, again, attracted to those electrons over there. So we'll have like this. And this will be a coordinate covalent bond right here. So, so this is what a coordinate covalent bond looks like. Really, the only question you get is which contains a coordinate covalent bond. You should know the definition, and then also you should know that um, they both came from they both came from the um, from one atom, and you should know these two examples: ammonium and something called hydronium. Both of these are on your polyatomic ion list. All right, next time we'll do molecular geometry. Um, that'll be our next lecture. Thanks so much for watching.